on the Communicators, a look at cyber attacks and critical infrastructure in the United States. In his State of the Union address, President Obama said that our enemies are also seeking the ability to sabotage our power grid, our financial institutions, our air traffic control systems. We have representatives this week from all three of those industries. Gentlemen, I want to start with an opening question for each of you. Uh, what are some of the attacks that have happened on your industry and how are you preventing them? We'll begin with Tom Kuhn of the Edison Electric Institute, which represents several electric companies in the United States. Well, thank you, Peter. So far, we, uh, have, we get pinged every day uh, from, on, on attacks uh, from various sources. Uh, but so far, uh, the major attacks that we've had have been on customer information systems or things of that nature. They haven't been the attacks that keep me up at night, uh, which is the ones that would actually do some damage to our critical infrastructure. How do you work to prevent those? How do we work to prevent those? Well, we have a uh, we, you know we have technologies, uh, cyber technologies, uh, prevention technologies. We uh, spend a lot of time now on looking at detection technologies. Uh, but again, if we ever got the kind of attack that that hurt our critical infrastructure, to which the president referred, uh, we also were pretty good on resiliency, redundancy, and uh, and response and recovery programs like we did with Hurricane Sandy. Pete Dumont is president and CEO of the Air Traffic Control Association. Mr. Dumont, your answer to that question. Uh, there have been some attacks on the system. Uh, they're not well publicized and they're not talked about because it's, it's confidential information and obviously you don't want too many people to know how the air traffic control system works. Um, it's difficult to explain air traffic control in a sound bite. Um, it's happened up in Alaska. And what's being done now is we have very ancient infrastructure for air traffic control. It's been around since Late, late 50s, early 60s, and it's a mix of different equipment. Uh, so it's very insecure. Right now we're in a modernization phase where we're modernizing, moving from a land-based air traffic control system to space-based, satellites, GPS, that type of thing. Um, as we do that, we need to look at how we're going to prevent cyber attacks, how we're gonna keep people from getting into uh, the system. So basically right now, it's education. It's letting people know what to look for, uh, how to identify threats, what threats look like, what they might be, and what to do when that happens. Greg Garcia represents the financial services industry, former Homeland Security Assistant Secretary for Cybersecurity. When it comes <coughs> to banks and financial institutions, Mr. Garcia, how do you prevent the attacks? What kind of attacks are happening? Well, you know, the attacks are always evolving. And for the financial services sector, most recently we have seen so-called distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks, which is, our, which is a way of flooding um, a network with um, information requests that cause um, a slowdown or a stoppage of service. Um, cyber criminals are after money, um, as is, was Willie Sutton back in the days of robbing banks. Um, they're after intellectual property, uh, lots of different types of information. So the, the, the attacks and the threats are constantly evolving. The banks are very well prepared for that. Um, they all invest hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, uh, preventive measures, um, in uh, very high-tech staff um, who are, uh, have great expertise in this area. Um, I'm uh, representing the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center, an ISAC, which is a grouping of banks and financial institutions that gather together their collective intelligence. They share information about threats, attacks, vulnerabilities, and they collectively respond to that. It's all based on the notion that forewarned is forearmed. Um, none of us is as smart as all of us combined. Um, so really, the, the best method of uh, responding to attacks is having advanced intelligence, sharing information, and working collaboratively. Are there any restrictions on the sharing of information between banks? Um, banks have to be careful about who they share with, so there are trusted environments um, within the ISAC and, and other industry groupings. Um, uh, certainly companies don't want to uh, share competitive information that would lead to antitrust issues. Um, there, are, um, there are some restrictions um, bi-directionally between the government, which has some classified information and financial institutions, 
And so there has to be um, a, a trust relationship um, improved there. Um, there are some areas where um, the government cannot, simply cannot share information with the banks, um, and, and the financial sector may not share certain information with the government if it runs afoul of privacy concerns, civil liberties, uh, uh, proprietary financial information, et cetera. Mr. Dumont, has there been an attack on the air traffic control system that has stopped traffic? That has stopped traffic? No, uh, absolutely not. But that, that's something we have to worry about. There are different levels of attacks, and, and of course there would be different reasons for attacks. So w what's the reason? Is the reason to bring down an aircraft, which could be a terrorist type thing, which would, um, as we were discussing in, in the other room, um, it's horrific and it's a big catastrophe and it, it gets a lot of attention. Um, more importantly, if we cripple the air traffic control system, uh, it, the air traffic control system in aviation contributes $1.3 trillion to the economy. If you shut that down, you're crippling the economy. Uh, we move 810 million passengers a year, um, about 137,000 operations a day. If we shut that <coughs> down, um, that's going to be an economic catastrophe. Our guest reporter, Gautam Nagesh <coughs> of CQ Roll Call. Thank you. Uh, you just spoke to the nature of the air traffic control system being quite a bit antiquated. Yes. So that brings up two questions. Does the fact that it's sort of pre-digital reduce the risk of a catastrophic uh, attack like rerouting a plane? And as you transition to a next generation system, will that increase the risk that is posed by the cyber threat? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, the older systems, you're right, they're less digitized. Uh, so the types of threats are different, as you know. Um, as we modernize the system, we, we're increasing the ability to enter into the system. In the old days, before we were worried about cybersecurity and cyber attacks, uh, the FAA was considered the air traffic system itself a closed system. Nobody could get in, and, and it was pretty much that way. Now as we expand the system, we have more people introducing things into the system, and we modernize the system. For example, as we go to space-based, uh, aircraft are going to become a node on an information system to do collaborative air traffic control. So the controllers aren't doing everything. They're working with the pilots, they're working with the aircraft. The aircraft have a bigger picture of what's going on in the system. As we introduce those into the closed loop, the flight information management system, for example, on the aircraft, that could be a way to get into the system. That could compromise the system. And as we open the back of the airplane up to more people using the internet, then that's a possible entry into the system through the flight management system. Um, Hugo Tesso, a gentleman from Germany, was in Amsterdam in the last three days. He just showed an Android app of how he can take over an aircraft going through the automatic dependent surveillance broadcast system, ADSB, which is satellite-based air traffic control, and the flight management system. It's got some basic commands. Go here, that reroutes the aircraft. Um, go down, that crashes the aircraft. And then they have something that's called, um, they confuse the pilot. Lights go off, things go off, the pilot doesn't understand what's going on. And again, the big problem is who, who recognizes that this is going on. So an easy answer to your question, as we digitize, we have more entry points into the system. So how do you handle that sort of threat where you can control a plane from a smartphone? Is this something that you're baking into the systems? And does the fact that the fleets tend to vary greatly in terms of their age and their technology, does that impact the way these things are secured? That's an excellent question, absolutely. Um, older, much older aircraft that are really no longer in the system were less vulnerable because they didn't have the systems that could interact um, on a, we call it SWIM, system-wide information management. Uh, networked enabled operations with aircraft being part of the network. Different, different fleet aircraft have different capabilities, but they're all getting up to a certain capability which would allow them to, to operate in the new system. Um, Mr. Garcia, you mentioned that the financial services industry shares a lot of information right now, and you also discussed the barriers. Um, are any of those barriers preventative to effective threat deterrence? Uh, is, and is it anything that could be addressed via legislation or administrative action? Well, I, I, the, the banking sector 
uh, generally supported the, the, the so-called CISPA legislation, um, Cyber Information Sharing uh, Protection Act, I believe is the acronym, um, which enabled company, which enables companies to share more information with the government, protected from Freedom of Information Act requests um, or other public disclosure. That might be the, the most um, uh, the most inhibiting deterrent to information sharing is the prospect that your information um, can be leaked um, to the general public and, in effect, putting a target on your forehead for the adversaries who now are better informed um, about your vulnerabilities, threats, and attacks. Um, where we're trying to push, also in addition to information sharing human to human, um, the uh, the Financial Services Sector Coordinating Council, which is sort of the um, the umbrella organization um, that uh, the FSI SAC is a member of, we have an R and D committee, Research and Development Committee, where we have specified um, ten major areas where we s where we see a need for research to fill gaps in our capabilities. And one of those is um, real-time information sharing, machine-to-machine um, -machine that takes, that, is, that enables us to look at vast quantities of data, aggregate it, correlate it, and, and enable us to make decisions, predictive decisions, about uh, threats and, and on incoming attacks um, in a real-time way that human-to-human -human sharing as, as useful as that is in trust-based relationships, um, the human sharing cannot do. So we're also driving a, a fairly aggressive R&D agenda, working with the government, the Treasury Department, um, other federal agencies, um, the academic community, um, to improve our collective knowledge. Tom Kuhn, how dependent is the electric industry on network computers and uh, other things that may be vulnerable to cyber attacks? Well, we're very dependent, obviously, and every other industry is dependent upon the electric system. So it is uh, incredibly, uh, the banks or air traffic controllers or whatever all depend upon the electricity uh, system. So we uh, are putting a tremendous focus on what we need to do on cybersecurity. Uh, we are the only industry right now with mandatory standards. Uh, five years ago, we set up a, a system with our uh, a, a self-regulating organization that we have called NERC that uh, was set up to respond to the blackouts uh, has set up standards in, uh, with our regulator, fe the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and they've been updated five times now. So we have standards, but I, I think we all agree the standards are kind of a minimum. They don't do the job. Uh, what you need to do to go beyond that on information sharing, uh, you need the information that the government has. The information has an army of intelligence and people out there uh, that uh, that we need to partner with. And we also have an information sharing group that is being expanded right now with CEOs and CIOs and others uh, to work with the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Energy to make sure that we get real-time information that Greg emphasized, actionable intelligence that we need, that we have the best technologies on the system uh, with respect to prevention technologies and also detection technologies. Detection technologies are key so that the industry can inform the government and vice versa in that information sharing uh, uh, scenarios so that we can actually move forward to address uh, threats that may come from, from uh, terrorist groups or from uh, national groups overseas that may want to harm us. We probably aren't worried as much about a denial of service, uh, which is what the banks are experiencing, or the exfiltration of data that people might use to steal corporate espionage or things of that nature, um, or the criminal attacks that uh, the people want to, you know, attack the banks to try and get some money. We are more worried about, again, the physical damage that would be done to the electric system that would disable the economy and every other part of the economy that depends on electricity. Are there deficiencies in the information sharing abilities? Well, we are definitely working to improve the information sharing abilities. There is information sharing that is going on right now through, again, through the, through, uh, from the government to, uh, to the industry to the federal regulators, uh, and FERC is, our federal regulator is, is greatly expanding under Chairman Wellinghoff's leadership its, uh, its own capabilities. But um, it, it needs to be improved, and it needs to focus on exactly what kind of intelligence we need, actionable intelligence, uh, 
And this is why we have a very, very high level group working with of CEOs and CIOs and, and, and others, working with the uh, secretaries of the Homeland Security and the Department of Energy and the White House National Security Agency to make sure we improve those information sharing mechanisms. Just jump in on, you know, the, the information sharing is a very important point. And, and as Tom said rightly, um, the electric sector, um, like financial services, uh, communications, information technology, these are the so-called millisecond sectors. Services are being delivered in milliseconds. Um, collectively, we and several other major industry sectors constitute the, um, the, the critical infrastructure of the United States. Um, and um, while information sharing is something we all know is critical, there are, um, as Tom mentioned, um, standards of practice that are necessary. Um, and we, the financial sector, is um, supportive and participating in the president's executive order that was announced in uh, early February, February 12, um, to set up a cybersecurity framework um, collaboratively with industry, with the critical infrastructure sectors. The financial services sector is um, heavily re regulated across many different lines of business for um, standards of practice. Um, but those are minimum standards of practice. And we recognize every day that we can be doing better, that we need to continually look for the best, uh, the best technology, the best practices, the best people. Um, and if we can use this process to collectively raise the bar across all critical infrastructures, because it's spotty, it is uneven. Financial services, electric sector, other sectors um, are fairly advanced in how we are at attacking the cybersecurity problem. Other industry sectors, not so much. Um, and we are all interconnected, and it's, it's a cliche, but we are only as strong as the weakest link. Um, and if we can find ways to get everybody, raise that tent and get, get a, a stronger, higher level of security um, that is um, standards-based but resilient, that's, uh, that is not stagnant, that can, um, that can um, evolve with technological innovation and standards of practice, that's, that's kind of what we're looking for now. Mr. We, DeMont, did you want to add something? I did. Um, I, you know, I think we can all agree that information sharing is, the, <coughs> is absolutely essential to get the best practices, to find out the lessons learned, the things that worked, the things that didn't work. But don't you agree there are barriers to information sharing, a lot of barriers? Uh, levels of, of um, how classified are you? How much can you know? Right. Uh, how much do you want to share about what your cybersecurity uh, measures are, how you're protecting your system, because the more you you let out how you're protecting your system, the more vulnerable it becomes. Uh, so I think there are some barriers that re we really need to get over in our information sharing, and there's certainly not enough information sharing going on. Yes, well, right. I think there's a much greater partnership now with the government than there used to be, and, and oh, much agree. greater attention at the CEO level about how important this is. Several years ago, the CEOs probably didn't even know who their chief security or chief information officer is. Now they're totally connected into them. And, and, and with the government, again, we've got this great new high-level participation to make sure that we can break through the barriers to information sharing, that we can have clearances uh, uh, occur much quicker. We've had a couple of uh, uh, secret and top secret briefings with our C CEOs, you know, with the National Security Agency and the Homeland Security. Uh, people understand what the threats are out there, uh, both you know individual, terrorist, national, etc. And I think that uh, the, it, uh, there's a new urgency going on in this whole cybersecurity issue. And I think every industry needs to be proactive because we all are very interdependent, as Greg indicates. Gautam Nagesh. You spoke to the fact that the energy industry does have standards in, but they are largely minimums. Um, can you tell us what impact has that had across the energy sector? Has, have those standards helped compel better security practices? No. I, don't, I don't mean to imply that, that the standards are minimum, that we're not trying to, to do good standards. I just think in any kind of standards regime, they, they, they are the minimum that people are required to do, and then you go beyond that. You need to go beyond that. For example, beyond our standards, we've set up threat scenario projects with the Michael Chertoff and his group, uh, the former uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. We are, are so we, we go from those threat scenario projects. We've got working task forces on each of the uh, key elements that we think are important, tools and technologies. What are, the, what are the best technologies we can use for both prevention and detection? Secondly, uh, on 
on the uh, issue of information sharing. What are the things that we need to do to really improve the information sharing flow between government uh, and, uh, and industry? And, and that is the focus of our, our discussions with the uh, uh, various uh, agencies that we deal with. And thirdly, very important for us is response and recovery. Again, we build a lot of redundancy and resiliency in the system. We do recovery pretty well, uh, like Hurricane Sandy, uh, where we brought 67,000 crews from all over the country to help get the system back on. But cyber is somewhat different, um, and uh, so we're working very, very diligently on our response, response and recovery plan. So if there is an outage, if there is a caused by cybersecurity, we can uh, uh, come back quickly. B but again, the question really is, it, the Obama administration and many Senate Democrats have maintained that the implementation of standards, even if they, they are baselines for critical infrastructure structures, would compel better behavior. Have you seen that in the electric industry, that the establishment of these standards force companies to take this more seriously? Well, sure. Absolutely. Because, you know, every <laughs> if there are standards, there are people in, in the, in the uh, companies that are responsible for implementation of the standards, there is a federal regulator that you have to go to to be accountable for the standards. And, and so there is that attention that's, uh, that's there. And, and I say, you, as I indicated, you, you still have to go way beyond the standards in order to uh, get the right kind of thing. And, and you know, the, the, beyond the standards, you know, one of the biggest threats to, to the security of our cyber infrastructure is the human element. It's the insider threat. Uh, the errors of commission or the errors of omission. Um, and uh, you know, employee training is one of the most important things you can do. You can have the best standards, you're going to have the best technology, you can have the best procedures, but if your people are not trained, or your customers are not trained. So the financial industry sees its customers as part of the broader ecosystem. Not only are we trying to protect them, but we're trying to educate our customers day to day on our websites, etc., on how they can protect themselves. Um, and, and that's really a key part of it. Yes, there are insiders who are malicious, but a lot of cyber attacks can be prevented if only your employees had, as a matter of habit, the knowledge that you don't click on that email, that you don't recognize, that you don't open the attachment, that you don't recognize. Um, if it looks suspicious, pass it on to, to your security team. Those are some of the most elemental ways of preventing um, cyber attack. And, it, and it, it, is, it is one of the biggest hurdles we have to get over. And some national security agency and the Defense Department uh, companies, uh, you know, have been had yep. breaches with respect to thumb drives being brought right. yep. into their system. It's very to theoretically play music. Even right? the people who right. should know best right. are still getting duped right. into into right. misbehavior. Pete, Pete Dumont, uh, the Air Traffic Control Association. First of all, who are you representing? Who's paying for any cyber security that uh, your organization may have? Uh, well. My organization doesn't have cybersecurity. What we do is, uh, uh, three years ago, we recognized that there was a need to start discussing and educating about cybersecurity and air traffic control. My members are individual members, like air traffic controllers. Uh, there are companies like Lockheed, Boeing, Raytheon, uh, the a list of others. Pardon me? The airlines, are they Yes, uh, some airlines are, yes, absolutely. Uh, air traffic mm -hmm. control touches every part of aviation, so just about every part of aviation is a member of my organization. Um, we, we recognized about three years ago the need to start educating. And what we did is we started putting a cybersecurity day in place. And what we did is we got uh, members from all different parts right. of the industry together, and we did tabletop scenarios right. and um, operational scenarios because that's really the problem. We have operators out there uh, that need to be educated that air traffic controllers. So in air tra we don't have the same issue that you have that somebody might open an email because the email system is a different system than the air traffic control system, obviously. Um, but if we don't, if we can't recognize that a threat's happening, then we can't react to it. So we're trying to educate on an operational level, first of all, uh, what a threat looks like, how to deal with the threat, and then a managerial level. So now what do we do throughout the whole system once we recognize a threat? Do we shut it down? How do we isolate it? Uh, do we have the capability of isolating it? How many different systems are affected? You know, those are the technical things. Um, so what my organization is doing now, we've got another one coming up in June, is we're having another cybersecurity day where we're talking about what we've learned from the first two, uh, talking about the, the president's executive order, talking about what maybe the agency, the FAA, can do to better beef up their um, management of cybersecurity. 
And so do you work with NSA, like Tom Kuhn said, or with <coughs> NHS, like Greg Garcia said? Well, we don't. What we advocate and what we think is the right solution is, you know, the FAA is the government agency. They need to work with those bodies. They need to learn what the best practices are, and they need to understand exactly what's being done in the different industries to deal with different threats. And that's how we're going to develop our own best practice. Gotham, I guess. Greg, you mentioned that the banking industry is largely ahead of the curve when it comes to these sorts of things, likely due to the nature of the business itself. And as you said, the criminals are most often looking for money. How would you say that the broader employees of your industry, how aware are they? How successful is, have your education efforts been, would you say? And have there been any keys, do you think, to your industry advancing that could be applied to other critical infrastructure sectors? I, I think I think the um, you know by and large employees within the financial institutions um, uh, are fairly well aware of what's going on, and um, and you know given over the last year um, increasing news about attacks on the financial system, the awareness has only grown um, as part of. Um, uh, every bank's um, uh, standard procedures, employees are tested. They're trained twice a year, often twice a year, um, and then they're tested. Um, the, uh, a random sampling of 10,000 or so employees will get um, a uh, so-called phishing email from the chief information security officer, um, and it will try to dupe them into opening up, and the email looks just about perfect, but there's just one little thing wrong with it, just enough to throw off a vigilant employee. Um, uh, and uh, if they actually open the email and open the attachment, um, they get a nasty gram from uh, the chief information security officer saying you need to go back to training. Um, if they forward that bad email on to, um, uh, to the security office and saying this is a suspect email, then they, they get a love note. Um, and, and so it's that kind of ongoing, and it has to be ongoing because we forget. I mean, we're dealing with hundreds or thousands of emails a day and documents and phone calls, and you're just moving. Um, it has to be continually ingrained in your standard procedure, in your way of thinking. It has to become a habit. Gentlemen, we only have about three minutes left. Very quickly, let's go around the horn. What kind of legislation, if any, would you like to see Congress pass? Um, I, th I think, you know, I talked about CISPA um, earlier. I think if we can get rid of the barriers, um, you know, as, as Pete mentioned, um, that, that hamper information sharing between the government and the industry and providing um, liability protection to companies who do voluntary to voluntarily disclose information, I think, I think that would go a long way. Um, I think the, the, go the government needs to continue to invest in research and development, um, basic research, the kind of research that companies... They're not, companies do the development side. Government needs to do some basic research to, to deal with some of these big problems that are coming as a result of the positive effects of innovation, but there's negative effects as well. So those, those are a, a couple of areas. And make sure that, that, that um, we, we clarify um, who's responsible for um, cybersecurity policy across all of the various industry sectors. Pete DeMont. I would agree with everything that that you just said, and I would also add that you know minimum standards are very important. So ensuring we have the right minimum standards in place, uh, ensuring that the government agencies that they're uh, being legislated focus on education as well as mitigating risks. And Mr. Kuhn. Uh, the controversial part of legislation out there is mandatory regulations, and, and again, we're, we've already got them, so we don't, we're not really concerned about that aspect of it. Uh, Information sharing, I think, is very, very important. The R&D is very important. Uh, liability protection, I think, is a very another important uh, provision to make sure that companies can go feel free to share information and not worry about uh, uh, lawsuits and things of that nature. But uh, I think the important thing is the executive order has been helpful, in my opinion. Uh, and, and But don't wait for the legislation. Sometimes it takes right. Congress a long time to do things, and I think we all need to begin to move forward. Uh, right. Uh, without the legislation. Okay. Tom Kuhn represents the electric companies, Edison Electric Institute. He is the president. Pete DeMont is president and CEO of the Air Traffic Control Association. And Greg Garcia has several 
<laughs> former titles, and currently is an advisor to the Financial Services Information Sharing Analysis Center. He represents the financial services companies. Gautam Nagesh represents CQ Roll Call. Gentlemen, thank you for being on the communication. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.